Salome, Izzy here with Holy Language Institute at holylanguage.com. Have you ever heard someone say that the Jews rejected Jesus and God's basically done with the nation of Israel as a result forever? I've actually, I've heard people say that. Um, you know, as a Hebrew teacher, I hear people say a lot of things. Um, those, I've heard people say, well, you know, the Jews didn't believe in Jesus. And my response to that was, well, who did believe in him? I mean, his, you know, all of his disciples and um, everybody who followed him up until Cornelius. Cornelius was like kind of the first official Gentile to believe in, in Jesus and what a wonderful thing that was. But what about before that? Everybody who believed in him was, almost everyone who believed in him was Jewish. There were like a couple rare exceptions, right? Um, and, and those were wonderful also. But the majority of people who believed in Yeshua were Jews. So obviously not all of the Jewish people uh, rejected Yeshua. It's important to realize. Now, Romans, I love the, um, I love Romans. I love the, uh, shall we say, the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. I think that's, uh, that's how it's sometimes referred to as. So, you know, I love this letter because Paul, he, he, he responds to certain suggestions. And it sounds like maybe this is stuff that people were saying back in his day, or maybe it's, uh, it was conclusions that you, you could come to. Um, and then he would, he would explode with this phrase. This is how it reads in the New American Standard. May it never be. Um, in Hebrew, the, phrase, the, the word is chalila, which like means sacrilege, basically. So, and, and there are quite a few instances of this where, where, where Paul will take things that people were probably saying in his time and then he'll just tear them apart. He'll just destroy those arguments. And uh, in Romans chapters 9 to 11, he does that with regards to several lies that people were um, were spreading about the uh, about God's relationship with Israel, and I wanted to I wanted to show you a couple examples of this because it gives me great hope for the future, and it makes me really excited about the time that we are living in now. So in Romans chapter eleven verse one, he says, "Okay, so apparently there were some people who thought, okay, obviously God rejected His people. You know, they rejected Jesus, so God rejected them. End of story." He poses it a question. And then he says, Halila, sacrilegious, may never be. And uh, the, reason, the reason I say the Hebrew word there, of course, you know, this, this letter was written in Greek, but um, we're, I'm, I'm doing a series of lessons reading through it in Hebrew. Um, here, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a quick peek here. So this is like a, a translation of Romans into biblical style Hebrew. And uh, so the Hebrew, equi Hebrew equivalent is Halila, the word right here. Um, but either way, it's a very forceful uh, whether it be in Greek or Hebrew, it's obviously a very f forceful response. And remember, too, that you know this letter may have been written in Greek, but Paul, Paul continued to self-identify as a Jew and described himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews. So you know this was definitely still his his background and um, his 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 mindset. It was a Hebraic mindset. So apparently this was not the case. And then he uses himself as proof. <laughs> he says, "God didn't reject Israel. Look at me." And then he also uh, he reminds his uh, listeners of the, the story of Elijah. Elijah thought he was the only one left. But then as it turns out, you know, God, God still had some people. And even though it looked like Israel had rejected God in Elijah's time, um, such was not the case. You know, not all of Israel. So apparently that was the same, that was the same situation in Paul's time. It looked like Israel had rejected God. And yeah, lots of people had, but not everybody. Apparently some things, some thing, some things don't change. He goes on to um, address another one of these questions. Apparently some other people were saying, you know, Israel stumbled so as to fall. They were, they were down for the count. It was over for the Jewish people. And again, he said, may it never be. So apparently, yeah, the, the Jewish people tripped up in a bad way. But were they down for the count? The answer is no. They weren't down to, for the count. And this is, these are the verses I really want to look at with you for a second here. And I want, I want to show you like what the Hebrew words would be. You know, again, obviously this is a Greek letter, but what the Hebrew equivalent words would be. Um, and then I, I want to show you, I want to talk with you a little bit about the book of Isaiah and the concept of vicarious atonement in the, uh, in, in, in Jewish beliefs. Because sometimes Jewish people will say, well, Judaism doesn't believe and has never believed in vicarious atonement. But there actually, there actually is that belief. It, so I'm going to share that with you in a second here. All right, so this is what he says. He says, by their transgression, so, you know, by the, the transgression of the Jewish community, salvation, what's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua. 
It's almost exactly the same as the name Yeshua, which of course is the original Hebrew name of Jesus. So Yeshua has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, he says, if their transgression is what? Riches for the world. And their failure is what? Riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their fulfillment be? So get, get, get that. Get a couple of things there. Firstly, Paul says that it's not over for, uh, for Israel. And he goes on to say, the best is yet to be. And he also says that this was necessary. This was part of this, uh, this grand plan, this, uh, this, this long-term strategy. He goes on to say something very similar a couple of verses later. He says, If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? But life from the dead. So notice here, yeah, the majority of the Jewish people did reject the Messiah. And yes, that was actually supposed to happen. That was part of the big plan. But they had to do that for this reconciliation to be experienced by the nations of the world. And that wasn't the end. There would be a time when there would be there would be a time of acceptance, and uh, that would that would that would spark an even greater experience of, of salvation and life for uh, for the world. And actually, the the Greek word. Do you know what the Greek word is there for the world? The cosmos. It's like not even just for human beings, but for the like the cosmos itself, like the universe. Um, there, there's going to be like a salvation that experience not just by individual human beings, but by the universe. Um, when like the the heavens and the earth will be renewed, and and, and the universe will uh, will will experience uh, like life in a way as never before, and re- reconciliation with the Creator as never before. So there there will be a the glory of God will be will be tangible in ways that it currently it currently isn't. So I want to show you a couple of Hebrew words here, and then let's talk a little bit more about about what this means and and why this why this should give us so much hope. So, this is, um, this is the translation of the New Testament into Hebrew by Franz Delich, who was a uh, Philo-Samite, a lover of the, uh, the Jewish people, and a great Hebrew, Christian Hebrew scholar in the 1800s. And he translated the Bible into Biblical-style Hebrew. Tons of Jewish people read, or, sorry, he translated the New Testament into Biblical-style Hebrew. I guess he didn't have to translate the Hebrew Bible into Biblical-style Hebrew, did he? Because that that would be silly. Um, and, and many Jewish people read his translation and saw Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, as a result. What's interesting here is a, a couple of words that he uses in his translation. So I had already mentioned that the, you know, the Hebrew word for salvation, you can see it right here, it's Yeshua. It's exactly the same as the name Yeshua, except that it has the, the letter He on the end, which makes it feminine. No, it's, it's spelled exactly the same other than that. So he says here, here's our word halila. So he, he says it's sacrilege that you would even say such a thing. And then he says, so um, here, let's read a, read a tiny bit together. I don't know how much Hebrew you've heard, so maybe this would be a neat experience. Um, I'll, I'll translate for you, so don't let this, don't let this um, throw you here. He says, ki for v'fisham, so in their pesha, their transgression, ba'a came Ha Yeshua, the salvation, the deliverance. This is also the word for triumph and victory. Like, you know, where it says that the Lord gave David, made David victorious. He gave him triumph everywhere he went. That's, that's the word, that's the word Yeshua. So, this came, la goyim, to the goys, to the nations, to the Gentiles. Lema'an, um, for the sake of hakniyam, making them jealous. Ve'im, and if. Pisham, so their pesha, their trans, transgression. Haya, it became the osher. So here the word osher is riches. And enriching. Haolam, for the, for the olam, the world. Maybe you know that word. It's like the universe, the cosmos, the world, big word. Uh, Venis kam. Now this is a really interesting word, nezek. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the Mishnah. It's the early Jewish law all written down. And uh, like from almost 2,000 years ago. Some of it's older than 2,000 years, actually. And uh, there are six orders in the Mishnah. The fourth order is called Nezikin. And it means uh, injuries and damages. So you know, it's just a lot of legal stuff about if, you know, if, if you're injured or if your property's been damaged and you know, the laws relating to that. Nezikin. And that's the word that he actually uses here. It's like to be hurt, to be injured, to be damaged. 
So they're they're um, they're let's let's say they're 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 being hurt. Le uh, Osher was riches hagoyim for for the nations. Mloam, their their fullness, their fulfillment. And then there's a fancy Hebrew phrase here for like how much more? <laughs> All right, and I want to I want to show you one more verse here that's it's related. Oops. I'll make myself tiny again. There we go. Okay, so and then and then in verse fifteen he says, "Kiim for if ma'isatam their rejection ritzui is reconciliation la olam um, to the world, the universe, the cosmos." Now I love this Hebrew word for reconciliation, ritzui. Um, it comes. It's related to the uh, the word ratzon, which is like your will, what you want, um, what pleases you. Um, it's from the verb ratza. Which, which means it's basically the same thing, you know, just, and it's related to the verb roots, which means to run. So there, there, are, these, there are these Hebrew words, this little family of Hebrew words, and they're all related, and they're rela- they, they come from this Hebrew word to run. So reconciliation is two people running towards each other, running with each other, maybe even sometimes running after each other in a good way. <laughs> you can be running after someone, let's say if it's, you know, in the case of me and my kids, it's usually to tickle them. Or you can be running after someone because you're really mad and you want to chase them down and hurt them. So obviously in the case of reconciliation, it's, it's two people running towards each other. Um, they desire to be close. They, they want to be reconciled. And, it's, and so this is, this is the Hebrew word that's used. It's a beautiful word for reconciliation. And, and then he says, how, how much more will be a, a seifa tam? Now this is interesting um, because the verb there is a saf, and it's also the word used to descri- in the Torah to describe the festival of Sukkot. The, uh, which is the, the Feast of Tabernacles. The Festival of Booths is referred to as the, the, uh, the Feast of the... Uh, in Hebrew, it's called the Chag Ha'asif. Chag is like a, a festival, and then Asif means to gather in. So it's the festival of the ingathering. And so um, in, in Hebrew thought anyway, the, uh, the future ingathering of the, uh, the nation of Israel, let's say back to the land of Israel, uh, being gathered back to God, um, you know... The, all of this, it, it's all related to um, what Paul describes as, he says, hello, won't it be Chaim, life? Maybe you know that word from the, you know, the classic Jewish toast, Lechaim to life. So Chaim, life, min hametim, from the dead. Won't it be life from the dead? Back to the English. <laughs> all right, so let's just sum, let's just sum that up. Uh, a couple things here. Um, firstly, so so Paul talks about like, the, uh, the the nation of Israel, the Jewish community, and their um, which words does he use? Transgression, um, and then he he uses. You know what? Let's just let's look at it together, let's, uh, visually. So, it's it's one thought, but he uses several words to describe this thought, right? So he says transgression, and um, and in the English here it has failure. Um, in the Delitz translation, he uses this word for like being hurt or, 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 or injured or damaged. And then he also uses the, the word rejection. So those are some big words. Transgression, uh, failure, rejection. Um, yes, there was some of this that happened, for sure. But then Paul says, it's not over and the best is yet to be. You know, be, th- this had to happen so that, so that the nations, uh, the non-Jewish world, could experience what? The cosmos could experience what? Um, salvation, uh, riches, and, uh, and life. Like spiritual life, yes, um, but also literal resurrection from the dead. So this is something that had to be. And he, he uses a couple of words to describe um, how, uh, w- w- what that's going to look like. The best is yet to be. Um, he talks about their fulfillment. He talks about their acceptance. So th- this is stuff that is st- the Bible says is still going to happen. So I just want to encourage you with that, that, that when it comes to the Jewish community, the best is yet to be. It's not over for the nation of Israel. And uh, apparently there's going to be a, f- a future revival. It's going to be the greatest revival this world has ever seen. And the nation of Israel is going to be at the very center of it. And um, I don't know about you, but I want to experience more revival in my life. I would love to see more spiritual revival in my family and uh, amongst the body of Christ. And uh, if that's something that you care about also, if you are passionate 
to see uh, to see God's people revived, then why not invest in this? What can you do to see the ingathering of the nation of Israel? What can you do to uh, to help the Jewish people see Yeshua for who He really is? What if it does start with you and me? Uh, you represent Yeshua. If if you if you're a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, then you represent Yeshua, and m- the Jewish people aren't all gone, and it's not like they all live in Israel or in Siberia. Like most of us have, like a Jewish uh, maybe family member, extended family, in-law, neighbor, coworker. Most of us come in contact with Jewish people, and you re- represent Yeshua. So what could that look like for you to um, represent Yeshua as a Jewish rabbi, as someone who loved and who loves the Jewish community, as someone who kept the Torah? Not because he had to, but because he got to. You know, somebody who really loved, lived out Psalm 119, the, the, the love song to the God's law. What would it look like for you to represent Yeshua in terms of your attitude and how you live your life and how you interact with Jewish people and with the Jewish community? Um, I just want to put that out there for you because I really believe that that question, um, it's, it's very relevant to, uh, to the desire that you and I have to see uh, greater spiritual revival in our own lives what if what if in the future it could be that could be like one of the lines in the sand that are drawn so to speak uh what if there are some christians who just hate the jewish people and reject the nation of israel or 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 fall prey to the the lies of replacement theology and they just think it doesn't matter anymore um what if they won't maybe i'm not going to say this for sure but what if what if that could be like one of those things that that causes people to not experience the fullness of the revival that god has for them uh, because god is passionate for the nation of Israel. Yeshua loves the Jewish people in a, very, in a special way. They are his flesh and blood family. So, you know, what if knowing God more closely, what if coming alongside the Messiah in his mission could involve that passion for Israel, that love for the Jewish people, and could involve some kind of practical actions uh, along those lines, could involve, you know, how we talk and, and what we talk about. It's uh, there are questions for consideration. Um, but I, I personally believe that that will be a dividing line in the future. So anyways, I just wanted to wanted to share these verses with you, raise some of those questions. I did mention one more thing that uh, you know, I'll just share with you, kind of share with you in this little conversation. Um, this is a, this is a translation of the um, of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, it was started by Rabbi Arya Kaplan. Um, the, uh, his translation of the Pentateuch is called the Living Torah. And then this here is called the Living Nach. You may say, what? What is that? Is that like nachos? I love nachos. Count me in. <laughs> nachos are very alive for me. I, I love nachos. I live in New Mexico. I like moved from Canada to the state of New Mexico just for the nachos and the Mexican food. Okay, maybe it wasn't just for that, but that's definitely, it's definitely a perk. Um, th- this isn't related to nachos, unfortunately. This is a Hebrew acronym for Nevi'im and Ketuvim. Laws and pro- the law and the uh, or sorry the, the prophets and the writings. So basically, um, the rest of the Hebrew Bible after the after the Torah, it's referred to as the Nach, the prophets and the writings. And this is a translation of them, the later prophets. So that would be, be like starting with uh, starting with Isaiah, and uh, it's really interesting to uh, I love this I love this translation. Let me show you something here. Like look at I just opened this page, and you can see there are notes. And there's not just notes, there's pictures. I love pictures. I don't know about you. And uh, so anyways, this is a great Bible because it, it, uh, it gives lots of the traditional Jewish views and opinions and interpretations on things. Or maybe if there's a Hebrew word that can mean multiple things. Um, this, is, this is fantastic for that. Check it out. There are even maps. I don't know about you, but I love maps. So I, I'm doing like a series reviewing Bible is coming from Jewish and Messianic Jewish and, and, and uh, Hebraic uh, perspectives, and I will eventually get to this one. I haven't yet, but you know you can regard this as a little sneak, pr- sneak preview, I guess. Um, something that's really interesting is to read the notes on Isaiah 53. Um, you know, for, in, for instance, um, on, uh, when God begins to describe, quote, his servant in Isaiah 53, verse 13, um, it gives, I'm going to see if I can show this to you, uh, it gives here a listing. You might even want to pause this and, and have a look at all of these different uh, these different views. It gives a listing of who Isaiah 53 could be about according to um, Jewish sages. 
And you'll notice here that there are a couple that don't get talked about very much, not in Judaism. Um, for instance, here it mentions, uh, I don't know if I can point to this very well, the Messiah, according to uh, the Talmud and Sanhedrin. Um, it mentions also the Josephite Messiah, so Messiah, son of Joseph, who will suffer and, uh, and die. And then it also mentions uh, possibly the, the Jewish people who, who perished at the hands of the Nazis. So that's interesting. It says, uh, these are notes in a, in a Jewish translation of the Bible that say, yeah, there have definitely, you know, it, it's, been, it's been a legitimate um, possibility in Judaism that Isaiah 53 was about the Messiah. Um, here's another interesting one, the note at the bottom here. It says in verse 4, he bore our sickness. This verse and the next verse seem to support the notion of vicarious atonement. And then I'll let me just read the rest to you. At the end it says, Others uh, interpret these verses literally and suggest that Israel's sufferings atone for the sins of the Gentiles. Hmm. Um, the notes a couple pages later say something quite similar. At the beginning I have Isaiah 57. It says, The righteous perish, but no one pays attention, etc. And... Um, then in the notes, one of the views here are that the righteous died to atone for the sins of the wicked. So, if you've ever heard, if you've ever heard it said, well, Judaism doesn't believe in the that Isaiah fifty three is about the Messiah, or you know, Jewish Judaism doesn't teach the uh, concept of vicarious atonement. The answer is two Jews, three opinions. There are opinions on both sides. So I wanted to share that with you, and I really believe that what Paul said in Romans 11 about Israel, it really ties into that. Yes, Yeshua suffered. Um, he experienced a, a rejection from the Father, so to speak. He, uh, it looked like he failed at his mission. I mean, for crying out loud, he was executed in an incredibly shameful way. Um, and all these things can also be said about Israel. God actually referred to Israel in uh, the prophet Hosea, if I'm not mistaken, is taken as his firstborn son. He said, Israel is my firstborn son. And then that passage was quoted in Matthew 1 in reference to the, uh, to the Messiah. You know, Out of Egypt I called my son. It's that passage. So there's this very close relationship between Yeshua and the Jewish people, between the Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, and the people of Israel. And could it be, could it, this is my understanding from Romans 11, just as, just as Yeshua, uh, he experienced this rejection and this failure and, and this great suffering so that salvation and reconciliation could come to the nations. Paul says that's what happened with Israel too. God sent his only begotten son, Yeshua, so the world could be saved. And God also sent his firstborn son, the nation of Israel, for the same reason, so that the world could be saved. Yeshua suffered and so did the Jewish people, so that you could be reconciled to God, so that you could experience his healing in your life, so that the nations could be reconciled to him. That, that's, a, that's a very deep thing, and it makes me want to cry. But if I start crying, I, I won't be able to talk, so I, I need to not cry right now. But it touches my heart very deeply that, um, that God so loved the world that he sent his, his, his only son. Yes, Yeshua, and also, yes, the nation of Israel. So let that touch your heart too. I hope you appreciate the sacrifice that, that the Father made in sending his only begotten son Yeshua to suffer. I hope you also appreciate the sacrifice that the Father made in allowing this, this temporary and partial hardening and failure and transgression and rejection on, on, the, part of, on the part of his precious Jewish people so that the world could be enriched, so that humanity could be reconciled, so that salvation and healing could come to the cosmos and all of us who live in this beautiful world. Um, there's a lot to think about. Um, thanks, for, thanks for joining me in this conversation. Um, I hope it's raised some questions that maybe you haven't thought of before. I, I hope maybe it either encourages you on your spiritual journey or maybe it could even have something to do with the start of a, uh, a new chapter in your story. Um, if you want to learn more, um, come see me at holylanguage.com. Uh, like, this, ba this is basically an excerpt from 
uh, my most recent Hebrew verses lesson, reading through the uh, the book of Romans in Hebrew and talking about these topics. I'd love to have you come and learning with me in a more serious way at holylanguage.com. So come, uh, come check us out. And uh, thanks again for joining me in this, uh, this conversation.